everybody. So, exciting topic today. Um, tropical revolving storms. You might not call them that, um, and we'll be talking about the whole naming thing very, very shortly, but the meteorological name is Tropical Revolving Storm. Um, they're kind of awesome, they're terrifying and deadly, but they're really quite impressive things. So, without further ado, they have local names, and yes, you're allowed to snigger at the North Australian one, which I've put in brackets because it's not going to, you know, it's not widely used, it's not going to come up in an exam, um, but Hurricane Typhoon and Cyclone are all different names for exactly the same thing. They're all interchangeable. It would just be, uh, if you're in the Atlantic, it would be called a hurricane. If you're in the Pacific, it would be called a typhoon. In the same way, and obviously you don't need to remember this, <laughs> but a humble bread roll um, is called different things depending on where you're from in the UK. Um, now, I have always lived in the Southwest and definitely don't say oggy. Um, I would say roll, to be honest. But then I suppose that might be because my grandparents come from the home counties, maybe. Um, my husband comes from Leicester and definitely does talk about cobs, um, etc, etc. We have different names for them. It's just one of those things. All right, so don't let that worry you. But they all are the same thing. Tropical revolving storms, hurricanes, typhoons, cyclones and <coughs> willy willies. So... Um, as I've said before in my YouTubes, it's a bit of a Russian doll thing. I would highly recommend that you watch these other YouTube videos. Uh, so pause me, watch them, and then come back again. Um, I'm going to send you a link to this PowerPoint so you will obviously have access to the links. The first one is um, National Geographic's Everything You Need to Know About Hurricanes in about two minutes, I think and it will just give you a nice little sneak preview. And the second one is the Met Office version, and um, that's just a bit more academic and a bit more scientific. But I would highly recommend that you watch those, partly because they're interesting and they've got some great video clips in them. Okay, so let's start off with what these actually are. And I'm just reaching into my bag to find my module booklet. <laughs> so I can give you a page reference so you can follow along. Uh, so these begin this year's module on page 50 and you will find <coughs> much of what's written on the screen actually in your module booklet, so page 50. Um, what are they? They're intense and I've underlined that because that's the thing to remember, they're very intense low pressure systems. We know about low pressure, we know that means bad weather, but this is an intense version, okay? And the reason they're called what they're called is because they can only form between the tropics. Once they've been created, they might leave the tropics, but they can only be created in the tropics, hence tropical. They spin because of our good old friend, the Coriolis effect, which is where the revolving bit comes from. And of course, they're bad weather, so they're storms. Therefore, their name is quite sensible. In terms of pressure, how low are we talking? Well, um, 888 is the lowest measured, as far as I'm aware, but of course, hurricanes are quite good at destroying equipment that is actually trying to measure them. So it is possible that there may have been lower pressures than that. We just haven't actually recorded them. Um, and I've just put at the bottom, generally you'll find that the numbers are lower than the storms we get in the UK. And the storms we get in the UK are called depressions. And what we have to remember <coughs> is that their formation is fundamentally different, okay? Now, depressions are covered in a different video, but basically it's to do with warm air and cold air meeting, the warm air rising and all of that stuff. Uh, this uh, tropical revolving storms, as I'll teach you, is to do with intense heat. So it's more of a convectional thing, whereas in the UK it's more of a frontal thing, all right? But they are intense. The great thing about them is predictability. And we talk a lot in geography about hazards, which are things with the potential to cause harm. And we talk a lot about 
predictability. So if I take you back to tectonics briefly, we've been saying that death tolls from volcanoes should be decreasing because um, if you monitor and predict, you can evacuate, all that sort of thing. But actually, we've realised we can't predict earthquakes. We've got this great differentiation in that. These are incredibly predictable, okay? So, part one, they can only form above the sea, first thing, and they can only form above sea that is at least 26 degrees centigrade, which is why they're tropical, because um, at the moment, let's hope climate change doesn't change this too much, but at the moment, the only place you're going to find sea temperatures above 26 degrees is in the tropics. Because the sea's warm, you get warm air rising. And remember, as soon as we have air rising, we have low pressure. So it's brilliant, if possible, if you could learn 26 degrees centigrade. That would be really helpful. So they can only form over the sea. They can only form over sea that's 26 degrees centigrade or warmer. And they can only form where the Coriolis effect is powerful enough to start them spinning. And the analogy I use here is if you have, you can practice this if you want, if you have a coin and you want to spin it, you have to kickstart that spinning process. It is not going to start spinning on its own, is it? <laughs> you have to do that flick with your fingers and it will start spinning. Basically, that's what the Coriolis effect does to these massive storms. Okay, so they're really predictable in that way. And then it gets even better because you don't just kind of go one, two, three, boom, there's a tropical revolving storm. They are created in stages. So the first thing you're going to get is called a tropical disturbance. And it's just an area of low pressure in the tropics. That's it. Now, it might fizzle out and die at that point, or it might start to spin. So it might get um, spun on its journey by the Coriolis effect and then it becomes what's called a tropical depression. That's confusing I know but tropical is the key thing to remember. If it gets a little bit more powerful and the winds pick up it will become a tropical storm. Now tropical storms do damage and they kill people so at this point it will get a name. You don't name stage one or stage two, you do name tropical storms. And then if it gets even more powerful and picks up speed even more, it becomes a tropical revolving storm. So if you think about all of that, if you monitor the sea surface temperatures and you look for cloud formation, because of course low pressure is going to give you cloud, you can absolutely plot the creation of these things, which means um, we should be at the point you know, where we can predict and evacuate and save many, many lives. You don't need to know this for the exam, I just thought I'd tell you out of interest. <clears throat> These are hurricane names, i.e. tropical revolving storms in the Atlantic, and they're all pre-decided, um, and they're on a six-year rolling thing. And I believe the deal is, if they prove very deadly, so for example Katrina, that name gets retired and it gets um, replaced with another name. So if they don't prove to be too bad, uh, the name will kind of get recycled. There's some great ones in there. You might even find your own name, possibly. Um, <laughs> what I find, and again, you don't need to know this for your exam, I find that because of the names, I don't think some of them seem that frightening. <laughs> and then other ones, I don't know, just seem scarier. Anyway. You can enjoy that list at your own pleasure. Now then, uh, the clip above is from the BBC and it's really good. Um, it's all about the creation of tropical revolving storms. So it kind of talks about the stages and things that I've uh, spoken to you about. I am going to play you this one, a YouTube within a YouTube, hopefully if it works, <coughs> because this one, uh, there is no sound at all. It is just satellite imagery. So let me help you get your bearings. This is Florida here. This is the Caribbean. Uh, well, this is in, in fact is the Gulf of Mexico. So um, Atlantic, Florida. This swirling thing here is Hurricane Katrina. Now at the point you're seeing her, she is a tropical 
storm. Okay, so you can see lots of cloud because of low pressure. You can see spinning. And what you're going to see is as she gets into the Gulf of Mexico, she gets bigger and bigger and more and more powerful. And that's because water vapor, warm water vapor is their energy source. The Gulf of Mexico is shallow, so it heats up much more quickly than the deep Atlantic. And look, look at the monster that is being created right before your eyes. That is properly terrifying, isn't it? And it just really proves to me that you can absolutely see these things coming. They give you warning time. They give you preparation time. Um, and that should mean that you can evacuate and get people out of the way. All right, so watch the top one, please. So <coughs> this one, TD, tropical depression, TS, tropical storm. Um, we're going to talk about the Safia Simpson scale um, a little bit later on, but essentially once it is officially a tropical revolving storm, there are five categories. One is the least bad and five is the worst. And I just wanted to prove to you, look, that if it's this blue colour, it never becomes any of these. So it might be a tropical depression and that's as far as it ever gets. It might become a tropical storm, which is the turquoise, and it might never become a tropical revolving storm. So they don't all necessarily become the, um, the end game, if you like. And in fact, I'm not going to get you to count lines because I think it would be impossible. But if you get a sense of how much blue there is compared to how much red, you can see you get many more of the weaker versions. And as you go up through the colours, you tend to get less and less. You can also see, I hope, a pattern. They form in the tropics. They are very predictable <coughs> in terms of where you would find them. What are they like? Don't lose too much sleep over this for your exam board, but it, it's just quite useful. Uh, they're massive. Um, and actually, in your module booklet, you've got some uh, numbers. If you want to learn them, fine, not essential, but it just gives you a sense that these are huge. Um, the biggest, I believe, that we've measured so far is 700 kilometres across. Massive, great big things. And they have an eye in the middle, which we'll talk about more in a little while. A uh, little while, sorry. They all travel west, okay? So they all go that way. In fact, just for revision purposes, in complete opposition to the jet streams. So if you can remember them as opposites and hopefully not get them the wrong way around, uh, that would be really good. And then they swing polewards. So they all go west and then the ones north of the equator go towards the north and the ones in the southern hemisphere go towards the south. Kind of a cool little pattern. They last between one and two weeks. Now, can I just emphasise that that's from the very beginning. So that's from the area of low pressure <coughs> forming, it starts to spin, it gets faster and faster. So that's from their very beginning. And warm water is their power source, as we saw with that footage of Hurricane Katrina just becoming this monster because the Gulf of Mexico has got some lovely warm water in it. What kills them, why they end, is they either move over cold water which is why as they swing towards the poles, they will decay because as you move towards the poles, the water gets colder and colder and colder. Um, <clears throat> or if they move over land, which is why it's only coastal places that are affected. And this map once again really proves that. The problem of course is if you're an island and these storms are up to say 700 kilometers in diameter, you're a bit stuffed because while the tropical revolving storm is completely battering you, it is still being able to pick up warm water from all around you. So islands are kind of particularly badly affected. Um, just a quick note, if climate change means that the Earth's oceans warm up, which is already happening, firstly, there is a question mark about whether the location that these storms are created might widen. 
But the much more pressing problem at the moment is that they will be able to keep going for longer because if they are killed or they decay because of cold water or land, well, if there's not very much cold water left, they could just keep going a bit longer. That's a bit scary, isn't it? Diagrams, yeah, you could um, draw them in, a, in an essay, maybe. That one's possibly a little bit complicated. Um, cumulonimbus cloud, the same kind of cloud that you get with the um, end bit of a depression. And uh, this, yeah, just huge swirling mass of cloud, really. The eye. Okay, the eye is a little bit weird. It's a bit like an anticyclone in the eye, in that if you were stood in it, you would be able to see <coughs> clear skies, the weather wouldn't really be doing anything at all, um, you're in the eye of the storm and yet it feels eerily okay. Um, well, the bad news about being in the eye of the storm is that the eye wall is the absolute worst bit. And of course, um, the whole storm moves as you saw with Hurricane Katrina. So you are not going to stay in the eye for very long and then you're going to get this really awful bit. Now, why is there an eye in the middle? We're A-level geographers. We don't need too much detail here. Um, there's just a different picture of the same thing. It is air sinking, which is high pressure. Okay, But the best way to think of it, <coughs> sorry, I've still got my annoying cough, is like this fairground ride. Um, it's kind of a centrifugal force, lack of centripetal forces, um, but it's a bit like that. So everything is kind of reasonably calm here and there's a lot of craziness going on <laughs> around the edge. We don't need to know much. You need to know that tropical revolving storms have an eye and that it's this very weird uh, high pressure area, clear skies, really calm weather, but it's not gonna like at last for very long at all. Okay, <coughs> so there's just proof, different names in different parts of the world. And um, you can see that they all go west and then they travel towards the poles. So it's just a slightly different map to show, <coughs> sorry, the same information really to you. Okay, could you draw that in an essay? I wouldn't. Who wants to try and draw a world map from memory? Not me, thank you very much. Um, now here's a little question for you, <coughs> and please feel free to pause me for as long as you need to. You may have noticed, and this map is in your module booklet as well, that there are different times of the year that you would expect these storms in different parts of the world. And I just would like you, and don't worry if you, if you can't, but I'd like you just to see if you can figure it out. Okay, pause me, scratch your head, flick back through your module booklet and see if you can figure it out. Okay, I hope you did that. <laughs> it's all to do, of course, with our good old friend, the ITCZ and the fact that the sun heats different parts of the world at different times of the year. So if we take hurricanes, which are to the north of the equator, then the sun is overhead the Tropic of Cancer in June and it warms us up and that's when you're going to see <clears throat> this part of the Atlantic getting warmer. And then we know, of course, that water has a really high specific heat capacity. So although the sun has gone back down to the equator by September, the water actually stays warm for a little bit longer. All right, so there's different seasons because of our good old friend, the, the ITCZ and all of that stuff. Again, well done if you got it, ladies and gents. Now, Sapphire Simpson, if you've got your module booklet, <clears throat> pages 52, 53, don't, you really, really don't need to learn uh, all of them. Suffice to say, one is the least bad and five is the worst. And um, I've given you <coughs> the descriptors for each one. So I'm just going to read a little snippet from um, Sapphire Simpson 5, which is currently the worst. Uh, catastrophic damage is expected. Complete roof failure. Some complete building failure. Small buildings blown over or away. 
all signs blown down, complete destruction of mobile homes, severe and extensive window damage. This, honestly, right, this is a terrifying sentence. Every time I read it, I just think, oh my God. Nearly all windows in high-rise buildings will be dislodged and become airborne. Severe injury or death is likely for persons struck by wind-blown debris. Nearly all trees will be snapped or uprooted. No, no, no. And it's just like, oh my God. Category five, terrifying, ladies and gents. But I just want to remind you about these things. We learned about storm surges in year one in the coastal module. And there is a video all about them on my channel <coughs> under the coasts section. So if you've forgotten all about storm surges, I would advise that it might be sensible to go and watch that one. Storm surges are uh, created by low pressure and what happens is the sea level rises and then the wind pushes the sea onto the land. Uh, they're also known as coastal flooding but they have nothing to do with the rain, it is the sea being pushed onto the land. And what you can see is that the worse the tropical revolving storm is, the bigger the storm surge. I know that's really frustrating because it's in feet. If you divide those numbers by three, you will roughly get it in metres. So that's eight metres of water. That's crazy, isn't it? Um, so I've included a little clip there um, from a news channel in America because of course uh, America experiences tropical revolving storms and people have to know what to do in a storm surge and it's just a little bit of news footage to remind you um, and if you'd like to watch it again or if maybe you didn't watch it first time round um, my favourite way of, of teaching storm surges is to show you some footage um, from a guy called Mike Thys who is a storm chaser. He is a professional storm chaser. I've included a link to his website here in case you're interested and you want to check him out. But um, he <coughs> has won awards for the best storm surge video uh, that we have so far and the link to it is here. So you may possibly get a sense of deja vu um, because if you <coughs> watched that during the year one section, you'll think, I've seen this. I've watched it, I would say in excess of a hundred times and I never get tired of it. I think it's brilliant. Just to give you um, a sense. So he starts off here. He films in Gulfport and he starts off at the beach. And the first footage you see is the very, very beginning of the storm surge coming onto the land. Quite quickly, he goes back to the hotel. And I just want to give you a sense that <clears throat> he's actually moved quite away in land um, when he films the rest of what he films. And you can also see, look on this map, um, we're quite near the Hurricane Katrina Memorial. We'll be talking more about Hurricane Katrina later. So I would definitely watch that. You don't have to check out his website, um, but he's quite an interesting man. And it will really give you a sense, this video, of just why they're so deadly and how unfortunately so many people are killed by them. Okay. So, as ever, <laughs> we end up at management yet again. We always end up at management, don't we? And we're back to our four options. And I'm not going to insult your intelligence by going through them again, because we've done that a lot. There is more information on page 54 of your module, which confusingly, and I can only apologise, also has the number 46 at the top of the page. Um, but it's, you can see it's photocopied from a textbook and it says reducing <coughs> the hazards at the top of the page. And if you're looking at that, it will give you some ideas. But it's back to what I was saying earlier. Because these are very predictable in terms of their formation and their stages, the whole idea is the same as with volcanoes. You monitor, you predict, you evacuate, you save lives <clears throat> by having as few people in the way as you possibly can. Um, there's also a link to a website there. This is a genuine, real website where it 
um, educates American people on what to do. So if you live in a coastal area that is likely to experience tropical revolving storms and storm surges, it educates you. And we talked quite a lot with earthquakes about how if you are educated on knowing what to do, it should save lives. All right. Now, case studies. <coughs> I'm really sorry about my cough. In your module booklet, pages 55 to 57, I have given you all of the information that, that you need. The only thing that I need you to do is to bring them to life for yourself. So that they're not just words on a page, but they're actual, <clears throat> real, you know, you can picture it, you can, you can understand really what's going on. I just have a quick drink of water to see if I can calm my cough down. So to that end, I'm just going to give you a little intro to both of them. And um, hopefully, when we get back to some face-to-face -face teaching, this is definitely an area I would like to pick up on because they're really interesting case studies and there's lots and lots to get your teeth into. So just for now, <coughs> I'm really sorry, introduce them to yourself uh, and just begin to get a sense. So we look at Cyclone Nargis, which affected a country that some people will call Burma, but really we should be calling it Myanmar. Um, and that's where it is in the world. So we're in Southeast Asia. And yes, if you have already figured out that it probably has a monsoon climate, give yourself a big gold star, because it definitely does. And um, so we're in Myanmar, which is a very undeveloped country with some fairly significant challenges. Uh, not least of which, <clears throat> just like Bangladesh, quite a considerable part of the country is a delta, so it's very, very low-lying, which means if you have a big cyclone with um, a big storm surge, mm, this is, I often refer to it as the Nevado del Ruiz <clears throat> of tropical revolving storms. This is worst case scenario. It's like if you did Haiti for earthquakes, it's that kind of thing. It's the absolute awful combination of poverty, people who had no idea that a tropical revolving storm was on its way to them. So there's no preparation at all. Um, and then a really bad cyclone and it's just that, you know, high death toll, lots of injuries, loads of homelessness. Oh, it's, yeah, it's pretty bleak, I'm afraid, ladies and gents. So <clears throat> I've given you a couple of YouTube clips there. I do need to say that um, one of them certainly has images of corpses in it, not obviously in a gratuitous way at all, but... Um, the whole point of Cyclone Nargis is that it was dealt with really badly by the government and they could have saved quite a few people's lives, but you'll see from the clips what I'm trying to get at. So um, all you're trying to do, remember, I've given you all the information and when, fingers crossed, we return to face-to-face -to -face teaching, I really would like to pick up on these case studies. All I want you to do is begin to get a sense of what they're like, what they're about, what the controversies are, okay? Hurricane Katrina will be much more familiar to you. And the whole significance is, of course, we are dealing with the richest country in the world and arguably the most well prepared for tropical revolving storms. And that is true. They were about as prepared for Hurricane Katrina as it is possible to be. In fact, I think it was about 12 months before, they had a full <coughs> rehearsal of a Category 5 hurricane hitting the south coast of America. They'd had a full drill. I don't think you could have been any more prepared. But I, what I always say to students, and this is not a dig at any of you, it's just the truth. It's a bit like having the best revision plan ever, but you don't stick to it. <laughs> you spend hours colour coding it and making it look beautiful and really thinking about it, and you put it on the wall and then you never do anything about it. 
it doesn't help, does it? <laughs> and that's kind of what happens with Hurricane Katrina. They're really prepared and it all goes wrong. And one of the things that goes wrong, ladies and gents, is New Orleans, which is the worst hit, is a city that is 80% below sea level, surrounded by water. Are you beginning to see a little bit of a problem? And the one thing they never considered in any of their rehearsals was that these levees would break. They didn't ever think that would happen. And of course they did break, and then, if you've got a city that is below sea level, <clears throat> what's it going to do? Oh yeah, it's going to fill up with water. And that's what went wrong. So it's nice and <coughs> juicy in as much as it's not your typical more developed country, lots of money, lots of systems, hardly anyone dies. 1,856 people are killed in the richest country in the uh, world who are the most prepared for these storms. And that just doesn't add up, does it? So yeah, you might be getting a sense that I love this case study just because there's so much to get your teeth into. Now I've given you <coughs> loads of links there, possibly might reflect how obsessed I am with Hurricane Katrina. And um, that's probably the reason I want to talk to you about it in class because <laughs> I just think it's brilliant. There's so much that we can learn from it. Um, so yeah, fill your lockdown. It's not going to cheer you up massively, but it will distract you at least from what's going on. Um, you've got the module, you've got some links. Um, yeah, enjoy, ladies and gents. I don't know if that's the right word, but um, anyway, <laughs> use it as a distraction. <laughs>